All right, I think we'll start now. I hope everybody's here. Um, as I said, this is the third in our autumn lecture series, um, The Common Good, in which we're exploring the question of individual rights and the social good. We are the partnership of Historic Bostons, a volunteer run nonprofit aimed at telling the stories of early Boston, Massachusetts, its forebear in England and the wider 17th century world. This talk is being recorded. Our topic tonight is the fractures at the heart of the Puritan society in New England between a system of laws and a failure to follow them, between a godly community devoted to loving kindness and the human desire for riches and real estate and the disastrous consequences of these fractures for the Commonwealth. The format Format will be a one hour presentation followed by question and answers. And to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. And then we will read them out at the end after the speech. Our speaker tonight is Lori Rogers Stokes, PhD, a public historian and independent scholar of the founding decades of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Lori is the author of a remarkable book called Heroic Souls, published last year by Palgrave Macmillan, that describes her readings of records of trial from Thomas Shepard's church in Cambridge in the 1630s and 40s. In Lori's telling, these accounts of women seeking church membership explode myths about Puritans. These women are not silent helpmates of men, but instead have agency as they describe finding their own spiritual paths, exploring sermons and scripture, and thinking deeply about their feelings and experiences. These women's accounts are astonished, astoundingly anachronous in Laurie's words, powerfully individual and unbounded by sex or gender, or traditional roles of parent, spouse, child, or parishioner. Laurie is also contributing editor for the Digital History Project, New England's Hidden History. Her new book, which she's working on now, will compare the Congregational Church's ideal of communal governance with the governance through kinship that was practiced by Native peoples. So now we'll go to Laura. All right. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that, Eve. I'm assuming, assuming that everyone can hear me and I'm excited to see everybody. I'm going to chat to you a little bit in person before I go to my slides. And that in, you know, referencing the work I did previously on um, records that women left church records in the 1630s and forties in Cambridge, actually, is a bit of an intro to what I'll be talking about tonight about the original sense of common good that the Puritans created in New England. They, they brought the idea over from England, but they made it happen in New England. And it was sincere and it was real and it failed. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to try to keep it um, as concise as I can. This session's being recorded, so you'll be able to look at, back at it later. You're going to see that my slides are extremely wordy. You don't have to read all those words. I'm not going to say them all. <laughs> it's just so that if, if and when you come back to look at this later, there it will all be. So let me start sharing my screen. All right. And that's up there for everybody. Okay, so I'm calling this house versus meeting house in colonial England. What is that all about? I wanna start by talking about something that isn't about me at all. And that's gonna be, if you take away one single solitary thing from this talk tonight, I hope it will be that you read this book by Lisa Brooks called Our Beloved Kin, A New History of King Philip's War. I'm not, I am among, tens of thousands, maybe at least thousands of people whose perception of 
colonial colonized New England was radically altered by reading this fantastic book. So I have never incorporated um, people, Native American nations into my work before. My work as a scholar of colonial New England. So that is a failing that this book has, has helped me to really see and feel and correct and has opened the door for me to the work of many other Native scholars. So our beloved kin, at the beginning of the book, um, Lisa says, if you come in the manner of a guest to the place world I've created and immerse yourself as I have in the documents and maps of our history, I hope your participation may be rewarded with the gift of seeing a world we all inhabit with greater insight and clarity. And for me, that world we all inhabit is the world we have become so familiar with of Puritan New England that we love to study, that we call Puritan New England, and the world we are living in today. My goal is to see the world of the Puritans here with greater insight and clarity and put it in reference to, if not into relationship with, the Algonquin society that surrounds it. Here's the nutshell. Of all of the Europeans who invaded the Americas, I believe the Puritans had the most real opportunity to find common ground with the native nations, the people of those nations living here and collaborate with them to create a new hybrid kind of commonwealth based on true commonality. They were the only ones who came over here with a belief in the common good and they let it slip out of their hands. This is what makes you at once so interested in the Puritans and feeling some sort of connection with them and feeling the most frustrated with them. You don't expect anything different than the reckless exploitation of people and resources that you find in all of the rest of the colonized Americas. Here you see, if you study the church records of the Congregationalists, as I do, so many opportunities to find common ground. From the Puritan side, not to mention the repeated, repeated offers to collaborate that came from the native side. And so it's that early congregational ideal of co the common good was real and it was overrun by the sheer magnitude of the impact that the seemingly infinite wealth of North America presented to the Puritans. I want my slides advance. Here we go. Did I skip something? No, there it is, okay. So how would the Puritans have defined the common good? When they originally landed here, I think they might've said something like this. Every member of this company who has voluntarily come together and is bound with ties of kinship has the opportunity to worship God properly as we see it and put their spiritual seeking above all else. And to survive, we will work together and support each other without reference to social class or wealth. And then the famous quote from John Winthrop, always having before our eyes, our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body, keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And he says, if we're able to do this, we shall see much more of God's wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. That's the understatement on which the Puritan mission was founded. It's quite an understatement. Had they been able to do that, we would be living in a very different world today. Within a decade of this sincere and real commencement of settling here with the goal of supporting the common good, everything began to change. And what I call the battle of house versus meeting house began. The English colonial house that we all know and love, that's so iconic, it's our harbinger of doom here because it represents the triumph of isolated individuals, individuals seeking, individuals seeking their own good over the ideal of community through reciprocal relationships. Before I get into the houses, I take this concept from Ray Gould, who is a Nipmuc scholar, the idea of place and space. 
there are natural spaces in the world that become cultural places. We assign some places cultural meaning and importance. And I give a few examples there. This is where we do certain things. This is where the land makes certain opportunities available to us. There are tricky distinctions here. If a place, I have it backward, if a space becomes an important cultural place, how do you mark that? And if you mark it with a structure of some kind, do you run the risk of eventually focusing all your energy and importance on the structure you built instead of the actual natural space? Now, if we begin with the native house, it's portable, it's assembled by a group of people at a seasonal location to live in for as long as you need to be in that place to do the work that it invites. The native house honors the space that it's put into. It's a communal shelter made from local materials. And once it is no longer needed, it is removed without any permanent harm to that landscape. All of these different locations, riverbanks, swamps, seashores, the near forest, the deep forest were places that offered seasonal work and gifts to the people. And each invited temporary buildings that embraced the natural landscape. And once they were dismantled, left it unchanged and unharmed. Meaning was derived from what a natural place offered. And you took care not to disrupt the ability of the land to offer that to you. Again, honoring that, that land. Here's why the English colonial house is our harbinger of doom, because it represents a shift to honoring structures over spaces, individuals over the community and things over people. Think about the colonial house. Here's the Cooper Frost Austin house in Cambridge. It's fixed. It's not portable or temporary. It's built by an individual and or men he hires on land the person bought and it's for a family to live in and to hold their possessions forever, as the Puritans love to always say, forever. It's legal property for an individual. The landscape is cleared and permanently changed to build and accommodate the house because the house has all of the value, economic and symbolic. The land becomes my land with my house on it for my family. And other people can't just come onto my land where my house is. And you see the whole world kind of shrinking down into that individual unit. Buildings for the colonizers were what assigned meaning to places. I will make this place my farm. No matter what it may be doing now, it may be full of trees because it's the forest or it might be a marsh, but I will cut it, clear it, drain it, whatever it has to do to become my farm. This place will be where I build my house. We meet in the assembly room. I have an office. There's a meeting house for worship. They could be anywhere. It doesn't matter where they are. And they were often you know, placed in locations that were not very congenial to those purposes. And the Puritans, like all um, settlers, really like to congratulate themselves for doing the terribly hard work of clearing land for farms and houses and all of these things that didn't honor the land itself and might've been better off not being created there. You can force the land to do something for you or you can take advantage of what it's ready to offer you. But because of their inherited ways of seeing the world, the Puritans assigned meaning to a place on the land and a building is created to permanently stamp that meaning onto the landscape. Harbingers of doom for community because the psychic distress implanted in all Puritan colonizers to get and keep a permanent house was a strong part of the land grabbing and resource wasting that characterized New England colonization and destroyed the ideal of Puritan community because very early on, within the first decade, the 1630s, when you can almost see unfolding in their documents, this realization, a false realization, but the way they perceived it was, we are in a place where resources are infinite 
and free. They're unclaimed. All I have to do to get them is get them. And this seeming infinite bounty was particularly impactful for the Puritans because they came from an England that had for at least the previous century been characterized by scarcity. And that scarcity was presented as the norm. There, there was not enough firewood in England in the 1500s and 1600s. There was not enough land as people began to enclose their land to raise livestock. People were thrown off strips of land that they had farmed for centuries. There's not enough land, there's not enough food, there's not enough firewood. Everything was scarce. And they were also persecuted for their religion. So everything was conspiring against them to keep them always on the verge of scarcity, of running out. And then they arrive here where it seems like if you could just get enough labor, you could have everything you wanted and more. And it's remarkable how many early Puritans from Thomas Dudley in 1631 onward talk about, we could live better than an English Lord here. If a man's willing to work, he can live like royalty. We can live better, better than royalty because ours is infinite. And this was you know, a very powerful drug. And very early on, you see Puritans competing with each other for land, suing each other over land and fences and livestock and all the other things that began to seem necessary before you could have community. Before I can enter into community with you, I gotta make sure that I'm set up in my house with my family, with my farm and all of my things. And then I'll be able to enter into community with you. Instead of the other way around, which was their original vision, we will all be in a community together and then we will help each other to get the things that we need. They broke and bent what laws there were to obtain law, land, by squatting illegal purchases from native individuals and leaders, setting their livestock loose on it and then claiming it, and corrupt land schemes. And they the drive to plunder what seemed like those infinite natural resources through individual profit seeking is not compatible with their own ideal of community. And you see the proliferation of new towns in New England is one proof of this. The original proprietors of a town were granted land for free. And of course the original proprietors got the most. So as new people came in and there was less to go around and it started to get expensive, they just leave and start a new town. And even the sons of proprietors might leave and start a new town. You always needed more. There was, there was more, so you needed more. Why, why settle for less when everything around you is more? But the only way you can get it is to act as an individual, buying, settling, building, all of that. For many reasons, the Puritans were not going to fully adopt native practices of restraint, resource management, and reciprocal kinship. It's hard for any group of people to encounter people whose way of life is so very different for those people to say, oh, let's just do what they do. We all are raised up in a society and a way, and it's very hard to, to just abandon it. Was there no positive alternative to this individualistic competition and plunder though within their own Puritan society? There was, remember the meeting house, that place for worship? It was actually the one exception to the Puritan rule of overpowering natural places with structures and then investing those structures with both deep meaning, this is mine, and brass tacks, economic value, and individual legal ownership. The meeting house was meant to be temporary structure with no worth, no economic worth. Its only worth was its symbolic representation of gathering in heaven. No individual owns it. It is communally funded, built, and maintained. It is not gradually filled up with lavish furnishings. It doesn't overpower the landscape or expand through lots of extensions. It doesn't produce goods to sell. 
and it's not part of anyone's estate. So this building that was in the center of every new Puritan town, and it's very the very purpose for that town coming into being was in itself worthless. It was not meant to be loved, honored, rigorously kept up, or become a source of pride. When you read church records, they will talk about raising a new meeting house. It's not celebratory. They don't say we gathered in a huge Thanksgiving because we raised this new meeting house and look how beautiful it was. If you needed to expand the meeting house, you did. If it burned down, you rebuild it somewhere. It had no purpose. It wasn't even supposed to be really a building. The Puritans defined they had two definitions of what happened when people got together. A group of people voluntarily joined together as one body to worship. That's a congregation. Everyone in Puritan towns in the 17th century, well, to like 1680s, was required to attend church as part of the congregation. They were required to go to the meeting house, I should say it that way. Only those people who had you know, but some assurance of what we would call salvation, God's grace, signed a covenant agreement to create a church. That's what a church was. If you grabbed a Puritan in 1650 and said, what is a church? They would have said to you, it's a group of people who have assurance of God's grace. They would not have mentioned a building at all. The meeting house was just the very unimportant building they physically met in. And you will find a couple of references till pretty late in the day in the church records of some um, old school ministers saying, I don't think we should even meet in a building. Jesus didn't meet in a building. Why should we even meet in a building? We don't even need one. You, you never called the meeting house a church or a church building. It had nothing to do with what made a church. A church was really a body, and uh, this comes through so powerfully. It's such an alien idea to us, but it comes through so powerfully in their own church records, talking about if one person in the church went awry in some way, how it injured everybody, and how nobody could be at peace until that person had been brought back into community, until the reciprocal bonds of kinship had been reestablished. We tend to think of the Puritans as just excommunicating people and banishing them. They would struggle for years, years, 10 years sometimes to bring somebody back into communion with the church. Because for as long as they were not, that church body was injured and it was not whole. And it might not even have really been a church anymore. And this is an idea that has far more in common with Algonquin ways of, of understanding community than it has to do with Puritan idea of what makes a town. Not only is the meeting house fundamentally different from that colonial house, it's opposed to everything that colonial house quickly came to stand for. And congregationalism itself is in this paradoxical position of being the whole reason why those people were there and no longer fitting into the society they were making. Oh, so we're going to compare what congregationalism told people every day in Puritan New England that they should be doing and how they should see themselves and what their common good was and what the civil society was telling people. And they're very different. And as I said, congregationalism much more similar to the native idea of what creates a society. In Puritan civil society, if you're living in a town, if you're in Watertown or Ipswich or somewhere, or Rowley, that town is your primary unit of identity. Towns have inhabitants. You live in the town, which means you are subject to its laws. Religious practice is that your primary, primary, the primary unit of your identity is the church you belong to, the church you are part of. 
the church of which you are a limb for that church body. Again, we'll see this all the way through. On the civil side, you are always separated out into being an individual. And on the religious side, you are always gathered back in to being part of one body. The family unit is another primary uh, location of settler identity. Each individual family is a separate political, legal, and economic entity. Nothing connects people unless it is something that they end up putting in writing, an economic deal, you know, sharing land, something. Whereas the church is always universal. It's in reciprocal loving relationship with other churches and a congregation in one town is bound to congregations in many other towns. So that idea of strictly being within one town and that's your main identity is really broken apart by churches which were constantly in touch with each other, writing to each other, visiting, sending messengers back and forth, helping each other figure things out, people moving from one church to another as they've changed towns, maintaining ties. So they were able to maintain ties throughout extended networks of churches. We've talked about the permanent house. Each family lives in a house owned by the male head of household. The church building, as we said, means nothing. Everyday life in your English town is transactional or legal. And this is not to say that the Puritans did not love each other and have friendships and families <laughs> and that you know, everything was you know, strictly business with them, but everything you did as part of that town was based on, it's, I don't know exactly the right word for it. You know, it's economics, it's making a living, it's buying, it's selling, it's reinforcing that segregated individual identity. Whereas spiritual kinship is the foundation of relationships and interactions in the church. Individual identity is the unit of law. And that's particularly important for property ownership. You go to court to sue your neighbor you have to make your case against that individual or they make one against you and you are doing it because you need something, you want something. It's all about individual action and identity. And in church practice, individuals certainly had their say and there were important individuals in each church, the church officers and the records are filled with, you know, powerful people who were part of a church, you know, taking a lot of airtime with their thoughts and feelings and speeches. But in the end, if you didn't come up with a unanimous vote for something in the church, you started all over again. So I could get up and talk as long as I wanted to and be as persuasive as I wanted. And if I didn't convince one single person, we'll just start over. We'll close this church meeting. We'll call another one. We'll open it with prayer and we'll start all over again until we all agree on what's best for all of us in this body. And finally, the civil government is top down and hierarchical. There was a proto democracy in especially the Massachusetts Bay Colony where towns, free men in towns voted for representatives to the general court. And that's important, but then the governor, the council, the courts, town councils all end up you know, passing laws down. Everything is based on the laws, following laws, not breaking laws, observing laws, being aware of laws. Where is, whereas in the churches, government is more bottom up. Churches vote again, unanimously to call a person to be their minister. They have to all be agreed on that and then the minister is chosen simply to represent them before God. He is just like a conduit through which the church and God communicate with each other. And he serves at their pleasure even more than political officers did. You could vote someone out of office if you didn't like what they did. Ideally, you have your minister for, you know, until he dies, he would stay with you. And 
the idea that you worked together as church and minister to maintain a whole that could then be I, properly represented before God, that was what they were trying to do. Now, there are fault lines, of course, in this congregational ideal. They were 100% on board with slavery and people in church records. This is what is so mind bending. People who are so empathetic and amazing in church records when they are trying to heal a rift with a brother or sister in their church held people in slavery and gave people to each other as gifts and you know bred human beings for sale which is what slavery is they did those two things at once and that's that's a pretty big fault line any community in the European tradition, at least, that's all I'm gonna focus on, I'm not gonna take on the whole world, is often defined against another group. We are us, not them. So slavery is as old as human history and it's happened all over the world. So it's not unique to the Puritans, but it does show that when they had their ideal of community, it was, <laughs> it embraced a small circle. So not only did it not include people who were African or native indigenous Americans, but not Catholic Europeans and not English people who were unreformed Anglicans and then not reformed Anglican English people who weren't doing it the congregational way. So we got down to a very pretty small circle that should really have guaranteed the success, if you've got it really handpicked down to a select group of people and your whole you know, settlement in New England is filled with these people who have voluntarily come together to all be the same, how could they fail to maintain that commitment to the common good? And again, the word I like to use is derangement. That ideal of community, even amongst people who were primed to work well together, was really torn apart by the what seemed like the unbelievable, astounding opportunity to take advantage of seemingly infinite natural resources. The other fault line, of course, the major one is the, the sexism of the church, which did not allow women, they could be part of the church body and more church members of that body were women than men always, but they weren't allowed to vote or attend church meetings or of course become a minister or have any other official role of officer in the church. And congregational ministers and church members built houses and started farms and put up fences and made money and bought and sold things and did all of the things in systems that they would later, a few decades later, start to criticize when those systems began to marginalize them. The ministers I admire, the congregational ministers, really maintained the ideal, even when it was crumbling all around them. And you see ministers like um, Samuel Phillips in Rowley, who were still working hard in the 16. 70s, and I think even, I think just the 1670s for him, to say to people, you know, church is not something you do once a week and it has no impact on the rest of your time. You should always be in church community. You, you should always be acting in a way that is for the common good. And you can't lie and cheat and steal land Monday through Saturday and then still be within the, the perfect body of the church. But these voices were marginalized. They were just, the more people saw that, the more they thought, oh, look at these kind of innocents. We need to protect them from the realities of life. <laughs> and they were just not able to get that message through. And once in a while, you, you will see a minister who is completely caught up in the economic opportunity and people who are preaching sermons about 
focusing all of your attention always on God on Thursday and Sunday are on the other days of the week busy, busy buying and selling in a way that those original Puritan founders did not, did not want to see happen. Town begins to push church aside, identifying more and more parts of life as town business not church business. And the one example that just comes to my mind is you start to see a friction where it used to be that the church would say to the town, like the church would send a messenger to the town meeting and say, we are calling a fast for two weeks from now. And the town would say, okay, we'll make sure we get the word out. We will all do that. And then you see in a few records, I think from um, Hassan Amisko or Grafton, like the church calls for a fast and the town says, mm, that doesn't work for us. Um, we will call a fast when it's needed, when the general court tells us we have to. Otherwise, if you want to have one just amongst yourselves, you can. That's a, a classic example of how as people began to recede from the ideal of what congregational meant, congregationalism meant and demanded of you at all times, they idealized it more like, wasn't that amazing? The people who can still do that are so, so good and godly, but it's simply not how it is anymore. And an interesting idea that I have just been thinking about uh, or encountering is, you know, all those famous Jeremiah sermons that are supposedly about the second generation not being as godly as their parents were. What, when you read those closely, you can really get a subtext of this marginalization happening of, hey, this church way used to be a lot more important than it is now. And it was, it's kind of easy to say, well, it's because of the next generation, the rising generation is doing it. Because in a way, that was true. But that was a process that began definitely within the first generation. And so instead of talking about declension and how people just weren't buying Puritan religion anymore, what you really see in a lot of these Jeremiahs is a, a cry to regain that sense of the church at the center of things and the things being spiritual and not political or economic. In that battle of house versus meaning house, I think we know that the house always wins and the fractured, individually oriented, economically minded, legalistic Puritan civil society overwhelmed and marginalized the communal identity and practice. It didn't go away. I have been reading a lot, a lot of church records from the mid 1700s. And you will still find ministers trying to uphold that ideal, but it is clearly going on at a much lower rate than all of the other really, <laughs> there's no other word for it than criminal attacks on land rights and native people. And again, it's really jarring. You know, you look at the Mayhews on what we call Martha's Vineyard. I don't know how to pronounce the native name for it. Noep, maybe. They're dedicating thousands of hours to writing down the spiritual achievements and experiences of the native people that they work with. And you would think, wow, they, they are people who are just, they wouldn't have time to do anything else. <laughs> they wouldn't have time. And with the feelings of understanding and connection they seem to have with so many of those Wampanoag people, why would they ever want to do anything shady? And then they did. You know, all of the Mayhews were land magnates who went to court to make sure they got plenty of land and the land could only come from one place, which is the native people who were driven into, driven or tricked into selling it or having it sold away from them. And so it's just a bifurcation of, you can think seriously about salvation and God and heaven and damnation, but it does not preclude really focusing on the things of this earth, as we like to call it. And so that ideal that Winthrop described, that the first, first colonists really 
you see wonderful demonstrations of it. And again, I think of the work I did reading the women's um, stories from Cambridge in the 1630s and 40s. The practice that they called mutual watch was actually wonderful <laughs> in my perception. A loving, attentive attention to the lives of people around you where you knew that the people around you were all on a spiritual journey and you would talk with them about it. If you saw your neighbor looking a little down and not being themselves, so many of the women describe, like I was in my garden and my neighbor came to me and said, what's wrong? What's going on with you? And I, I talked with my neighbor about this and they said, don't despair. You see that over and over again. And just that assumption that they had for a, a brief time that we're all on the same page, we're all dedicated to the same thing. And if, if you don't succeed, I don't succeed. And I'm not going to be happy if you're not happy. That was really lived out for, for a brief time by the Puritans within their very small circle. Always having before their eyes, their community community in the work. You know, it wasn't some kind of ethereal thing of we'll all just kind of sit in a circle and hold hands and just gaze, <laughs> gaze upward or something. It was community in the work. Whatever we are doing, and there's a lot to do, we're going to do it as one for the common good because we're members of the same body. And the only way to preserve unity of spirit is peace. And the only way to preserve peace is through unity of spirit. That's where they began. But I would say even a decade later, their definition of the common good had changed to mean more like a legal document. You, a free male inhabitant of this town, <laughs> have the opportunity to pursue your personal wealth so that you can get married on a home and support your family. If you fail, you fail. And that's, that's on you. Again, we, I love to make the blanket statements. No attitude is always completely universal. But you really see a perilous shift from community to individual. And to something that we're more familiar with as the American dream. What is it? It's for every individual isolated nuclear family, not all the generations, just parents and children, to own and live in a single family home as a sign that the head of the household can support that family without help from anybody and shouldn't be asked to help anybody else to do the same. Isolation is success. And those who fail to achieve that dream are demonized and those who reject it are ridiculed. And the common good is kind of replaced by this zero sum game of endless competition for resources and wealth. And this is where this all comes into relation to our world today. Am I saying that this is how our society is characterized today because of the Puritans? No, obviously you can't draw a straight line to say, oh, if only the Puritans had been different everything would be better now and we would still have that original ideal of community. But they are one influential strand or you know, little set of yellow bricks going down that road because they were so impactful in their own time and afterward. as they lost their grip on that ideal, they found ways to justify it that we still use today. Acquisition was simply always on their minds. It was at once a burden and an opportunity. It was an unbearable opportunity because it could just slip away. If you are faced with, you know, an overflow of riches. You can't grab them all. You can't get them all into your hands. And you just focus on, oh, how much can I get? And why couldn't I get it all? And if I don't get it, someone else is getting it. 
And this sense of infinity, though of course wasn't infinite, created obsession. Acquisitions never left their minds, no matter how much they already had, because as long as land and opportunity are infinite, desire is insatiable. This desire was criticized, but it was allowed because everyone participated in it. And I think, um, whose book did I read where they said that this, you know, the psychic distress that the, these people felt in this moment of, if I don't grab it, it'll go away. Infinity will turn into scarcity again, just like it was in England. The infinite might slip away from me. Um, I can't remember where I was going with that. <laughs> I was busy thinking about where I saw that quote. Oh, it made them doubly incapable of perceiving indigenous people, Algonquin people in the region as living successfully because those indigenous people had learned restraint and resource management. And if you ate less in the winter, you eat less in the winter. And they lived a, work, a life of carefully maintaining the land's ability to give them the things they needed in exactly what the Puritans would have called a competency, by which they meant just enough for everyone to keep living and for the land to keep providing. That's what the Puritans called a competency. And the Puritan definition, unfortunately, of a competency began to balloon into, well, if you have thousands of acres of land and slave, enslaved people and lots of livestock and several houses, then you have a competency. They were blinded and unable to perceive indigenous Algonquin people as living successfully because they were only living with a competency. And so they were unable to connect their own religious ideal of community to the remarkably aligned native um, ideal. It wasn't ideal because they lived it out every day, native way of having community. And they were just unable to perceive it. We tend to leap immediate to, they refused to see it because they were racist. Racism was a means to an end, like it always is. If it helps me to get more land by saying another group of people are not as good as I am, then I'll do it. But really it was just a complete inability to even take it in, to even see some of the similarities in their own ideal. And inevitably, personal freedom became horribly linked to and equated with material wealth. Wealth was the result of freedom to acquire land and goods. And acquiring wealth made freedom possible to all because the resources were supposedly infinite. And we tend to think of the Puritans as having a battle between you know, their ideals of freedom and wealth, but that wasn't it. The real problem was that they became linked. I have to be free to become rich and I can't be rich if I'm not free. And it's rich, being rich that actually guarantees freedom. <sighs> we all live inside this fault line that started back then. And now we have all the consequences of reckless acquisition and consumption. And now is the time to act. How can you act as a scholar, as someone who cares, all of the people here, everyone here cares about studying our past, whoever our is for you, the past. Read the past with new eyes. Stop reading only accounts by other people like you of the past and think about how ideas, you know, how we live with the results of these ideas today. We all know that the past, you know, obviously it leads to the present, but for my, in my case at least, seeing just how deep this idea runs and just how long it was able you were able to successfully pursue this reckless acquisition for a couple of centuries. That's a long run, long enough to thoroughly normalize it. And it's very hard to go and break that all down. But that's what makes 
studying the Puritans in 2021 valuable? I'll close again with a quote from Lisa Brooks. We wanna discern new and ongoing interpretations that can decolonize and expand our collective understanding of the people we study and the people we are. Thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we have at least one question in the chat. Um, and if people have other questions, if you could put them in the chat, that would be very helpful now. Um, I'll read um, this last one from Michael Rhodes, and, and then maybe you can address this, Laurie. Since we tend to hold people, religion, regions, and cultures of the past to modern day sensibilities, such as slavery and women's rights, one way to reflect on the history of a region and culture, such as Puritan New England, is to assess their legacy. I don't think it's an accident that Massachusetts was the first place on earth to constitutionally outlaw slavery by 1783, Boston and New England were the epicenters of transcendentalism, of the abolitionist movement, and even today is the most educated region in the United States. I find studying the Puritans interesting because I see a link to New England's multi-generational movement toward uni universal rights and its original Puritan culture. What are your thoughts on the link between Puritans and later generational progress that began in New England? I think it is really a mixed legacy. And, you know, there's so much to admire about what the Puritans achieved. They did have, and they did this all out of whole cloth. They had no examples in their own world in England to base this on. They created a proto democratic government. They actually got together a written description of their religion, congregationalism, that. And with all of these things, their first code of law, they did all these things that people had struggled and would continue to struggle for another century to do in England. They did in the first 10 years. And they did it all by coming up, having a collaboration between many people to create something. And then they sent it to all the towns to be read out to the people, get comments and suggestions, revise it, send those out to all the towns again they really lived up to that ideal of we're going to let everybody have a voice and there's going to be representative government of free white male inhabitants. And it's amazing. And it was that energy that kept, kept driving and driving in New England that did make it the eventual hotbed of the revolution in the late 1700s. When you think about the, the less interesting part, I'm looking at the chat now just to get a little refresh on the question. I, I don't, was it the first place to constitutionally outlaw slavery? I'm not up on that. I don't know if they were, but that was a battle. It was a battle to do that. And we all remember, everyone who likes to study this era, how Samuel Sewell tried to get a, a fire going about abolition in the 1690s and nobody was buying it. I kind of push back on uh, the relativism. There's never a time in human history when people didn't know that slavery dehumanized people, when slavery was not breeding human beings for sale. Everyone always knew that. There was never a time when they just didn't get it that slavery was bad. So they did that unapologetically in the Puritan era. And it took a long, long time to get a majority of people in Massachusetts to say, let's not do this, let's abolish it. So it is the most educated region. That's another great thing they did. Every boy and girl, man and woman had to learn to read and ideally to write, not always to write, but to read because you had to be able to read your Bible. And that created another legacy of literacy that's been very impactful on the, you know, the revolutionary era and the goals for the United States. 
So everything that's good that came out of it, like abolitionist movement and education, public education, it had some roots in that Puritan era, but often like the transcendentalists would have said, I believe that they were really pushing back against the negative parts of that. And what were the transcendentalists all about? Rejecting materiality, trying to reconnect with the natural world and to honor it. And that was something that they was not preserved or honored by the Puritans ever, ever. If we're looking at another question, I'm gonna go up a little bit. Um, yeah, someone uh, notes that in England, house also means a family, like fall of the house of Usher or the house of Windsor. It means a family that was wealthy that had a huge mansion it lived in on its land. That's a household. And the Puritans said to themselves, like you come over and you think the most important thing is going to be our community. And then you think I could have all of that. I could have it. There was never a chance I could ever establish my house, my lineage in England. It wasn't going to happen because everything was too scarce. And here I could do that. Or I could let all that go to somebody else while I focus on just having a competency. It was very hard for most people to say, you know what, I won't take, I won't take advantage of that opportunity. I'll, I'll just stick with getting by. I, I was thinking uh, as you were speaking, Lori, that, um, that some of what you're saying could be true of humanity in general um, and perhaps settlers of, of lands that they didn't come from, perhaps, I don't know. But there's a question from Joyce Walker that gets a little bit to this, and I thought I would read that one. Do you know of any societies where the common good has persisted over time? You know, even, uh, even a year ago, uh, yeah, even a year ago, I would have said, uh, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I do. And then last fall, I was at an online conference for, I can't remember which history organization, and I heard Lisa Brooks speak. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, maybe I'll get her book, which at that point was already a year old and had won every award under the sun. <laughs> I would have not been aware of it. And that led me to read work by other Native American scholars and to go to YouTube and find all sorts of interesting young indigenous people who are doing things and I think I would point to those communities. Those seem to be, to my outside observation, to be people who have survived by maintaining that sense of community and reciprocal kinship, despite centuries of efforts to destroy that in them. But they, they managed to maintain that. And that has been the secret to them maintaining that um, indigenous identity. Hmm. I don't remember where that meeting house is. Someone's asking, where's the meeting house that I got a picture of? I just found it online and I, I can't remember. I could try to take a look. Um, it's somewhere, somewhere here in New England. What are, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about those cultural beliefs and practices in the native community that allowed the um, persistence of the notion of maintaining the common good? Oh, not really, because I, I, I am loath to speak for them. And I believe that if we have anyone who is attending who is an indigenous person, they would be better equipped to answer it. I can only tell you what I have gathered through um, my own looking into it. So I would open the floor if somebody else is um, an indigenous person who would like to respond. And if not, I would just say, oh, go ahead. Hi, Lori, um, Lance Young, chief of the Namaskit tribe. 
um, descendant of the original first contact people that you're speaking about here and the ones in Lisa Burke's book, which I have read many times. Um, there was the idea of that word would not have even been part of the lexicon of indigenous people. It just was a way, it was a way of, it was the way of it. It was the way of their lives that there was this sense of mutual sharing and, 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 pe and people didn't, didn't have that concept of this is my possession. This is only my house. This is only my plot of land. It was, we are all share, you know, we're fighting this battle in um, in New Hampshire about um, a, a dump that Casella wants to put um, 180 feet from Forest Lake. And one of the things that came up was Native Americans never, you never, you'd be hard pressed as an archaeologist to find a Native American dump because there was no such thing. Because we only took from the land exactly what we needed that everybody could share, even the things that you would consider waste, bones, you know, the shells. We used absolutely everything for everybody so that there was no homelessness. There were no, there were no poor people in the sense of what we understand. Even at, in colonial times, there was, yes, there was a hierarchy. There was a sachem. There were, you know, um, different, but they didn't look at it as I have more than you, the sachem would think of himself as a failure if everybody in his tribe or her tribe, because there were squash agents as well in, and Lisa Brooks talks about my ancestor Witamo, who was a, a big, big, big central player in King Philip's war, much more than most people will ever understand how much of a great role she played in, in that war. But they would think of themselves as failure if their people, if everyone in that tribe and even some of the sister tribes didn't have everything that they needed. So whatever your talent was, whatever it was you gave, you gave that to everybody and whatever they had, they gave that to you. So that sharing was, it was just part of, of the being of who we were. So, you know, that the, we didn't have to constantly think, oh, this is for the common good. It was sort of, of course we do this for each other because that's how we have existed for all of these years. And I often think, can you imagine if we had we had been able to appropriate that thought system in everything that we did? As you said earlier about the crisis that we're in in this world, we wouldn't be in this situation today if we had figured out, no, let's not deplete all of the trees from wherever. Let's not pull all of this oil out of the ground. Let's, let's not destroy and strip mine. Let's not do these things because we know at the end of the day, we're destroying ourselves. So to me, I don't know if I've, if I've gone on too long, if I've answered the question, but I think no. the idea of the common good was just part of, of how, we, how we were as human beings to each other and to everything else, right? We never thought of the trees as not being equal to us or the water not being important to us. So that to me is, is, is the difference, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. <laughs> and one of the feelings, strong feelings I came away with after reading um, our beloved kin that was maintained each time I read a native work was just this horrible feeling of loss. Like just could have, could have gone in a direction that would have you know, meant you know, a competency for all and instead it's just natural loss. And I just want to address your question Lance that you put into the chat. I wanna be very clear about this, Lance asked, um, having a hard time grasping the concept that the Puritans ever saw um, my ancestors' lances in the same light as they saw each other. Their own writings describe Native people in less than language. So how can the Puritans have had the most chance to reach out to these people? And you're right. Nowhere do I see the faintest glimmer of a realization in church records that A, you know, what they are trying to practice, um, well, I'll just say what they were trying to practice had anything in common with anybody else. That was one of the Puritans' great failings is they believed that they were unique in the whole world. Nobody was doing what they did. Not other English people, not other Europeans, nobody, it was just them. And of course, they could not ever believe that people who had not been raised in Christian European culture could understand anything that 
European Christians did. And they could never believe that a non-Christian European um, culture could be as good as, as intelligent as a European culture, incapable of doing this. Before they ever thought of it in terms of racism, incapable of thinking of this, the, the inward self, you know, grandizing nature of their thought just made that always impossible. So they did not see any possibility of any kind, most of them, any kind of real connection with and collaboration with. You'll see little tantalizing glimpses of it where one individual, um, and Lisa Brooks names a few, actually lived some time with native people and thought, hey, you know, this could happen. But they were, you know, one in a million. And so what I'm describing is my own perception mm. of I've spent years reading congregational church records. And when I was reading native scholars describe the role of the sachem or the song squa, just thinking this is exactly what a minister was supposed to do. This is what a minister was supposed to do for people. The roles seemed so similar. And when I saw how that congregational ideal was marginalized, I thought, wow, even their own society, you know, they didn't fit into their own society. Even these white English reformed Anglican Puritans didn't fit in if they were prioritizing the spiritual over the political. And so if only they had said, <laughs> you know, uh, let's, all, let's try to collaborate with native people who we share this in common with even though it was not identical, it was not the same. And I don't want to say that, oh, this wasn't unique to native people. The Puritans were doing it too. As you just well described Lance, it was very different. So what I'm doing is say, I'm seeing something they never ever saw. And if I had been able to say it to them in 1660, they would have said, oh, no, you're so wrong. <laughs> but I believe that I'm right. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I think you're, you're on to something and we in the in the partnership here have talked about that like there was this thing that had this possibility but it was out of the it was out of reach um and 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 how you describe that concept was 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 there for a time period there was this the ideal that maybe there could be this mutual sharing and so forth but they just couldn't grasp it long enough to as you said make it realize within their own society let alone bring in this 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 Right. these people who were so very different them in every way, the way they dressed, the way they spoke, the way they lived, the way everything was so, the, their concept of spirituality was so different. So I, I think that for me, what I was, I, I always wish we had gotten to that point. We would be a different world if we had gotten to that realization. So thank you. Thank you. Um, is this relying on a simplified or naive or romantic perspective that community is better than the individual. Didn't fascism and communism uh, promote a common good? Yeah, it has to be an authentic common good. And that an authentic common good is one that springs up from all of the people who say, we choose voluntarily to work together toward whatever goal it may be, rather than I believe fascism usually imposing on people like I have decided what you want to work for and anyone who doesn't do it is going to be persecuted. And you know, it's, it's clearly a common good in quotes when you have that. I don't think you can, I don't think you can romanticize or be too naive about the kind of community that slipped away here. I think we are very wary about it because we've never experienced it <laughs> unless you are an indigenous person. I've never experienced it. And you tend to think it can't be real. If it was real, how come nobody has ever been able to do it? And so I think our native hesitancy and our inherited skepticism are just kind of symptomatic of how it has it has never been able to really get a strong footing. I think the closest we have come to it are those periods in US history where people were fairly united around the idea of being an American, like celebrating being an American in a certain way. 
and those those didn't even last because they would eventually people were not all on board with that. So I know I you know normally I would say oh yes we shouldn't over we shouldn't romanticize it but then I think that we shouldn't resist it as much as we do either. One of the um, comments asks you if the Amish would be an example of uh, devotion to the common good. Again, I have to say, I don't know. I, I have never, I've never studied it. I haven't lived it. Um, I think we would have to talk with an Amish person to find out. I really don't know. I'm not just saying, oh, I don't want to put my interpretation on it. I, I really don't know. And it's, I'm sure there have been lots of studies and um, historical studies of Amish people. It'd be interesting to look into. And so uh, Marilyn Roach wrote that the meeting house that you showed is in Danvers at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead. Oh, thanks, Marilyn. I was, it was on the edge of my mind to say it was Salem, but then I thought I had to be wrong. Thank you. Yes, it's a replica in Danvers at the Nurse Homestead. Thank you. When did Puritans stop meeting in their meeting houses? There, it was a slow, gradual change, but it was later than you might think. I would, I would say that by the time of the revolution, that's when the change really started to happen of people saying, you know, I don't really want to be in this uh, rickety, bare, freezing, you know, plain old meeting house and towns began especially after the revolution when we were a nation and there was that huge 19th century investment in towns and every town had a thousand page history written about it, no matter how small it was. That's when each town began to build like churches and call it a church. You really see that switch over after the revolution of not saying meeting house anymore, but saying a church and wanting it to be beautiful. So I would say that's when the meeting house kind of came to an end. Uh, someone asks about um, indentured servitude. Uh, there were whites who uh, were indentured. Um, yes, I mean, when you are trying to grasp millions of acres <laughs> of riches, you will get labor from wherever you can find it. And you will enslave people. And if you feel that somehow you cannot enslave someone, you will simply do temporary slavery of indenture. Um, but one of the things people will celebrate about New England in traditional histories is that so many people who were indentured, once their term ended, they were able to become successful. They became landowners who then indentured other people to work for them. This didn't happen if you were enslaved. There was no happy ending because if you were able to get the person enslaving you to actually let you go when your official term was over, you were lucky. And then your children were enslaved after you and you know you, were, you had been enslaved and you were always going to be um, a black or native person. And so you know, the, there's not the semi-guaranteed happy ending for people who are enslaved that there was for people who were indentured. There, there's a comment about the Congregationalist Puritans breaking with the Transcendentalist Unitarians in 1836, um, which is a little like a little bit later, but similar to what you were saying. And then um, somebody wrote, Roxanne wrote, the partnership meets when we could at First Church Boston. Does church here mean the congregation rather than the building? Yes, it did originally. It would have meant not the congregation, but the church, those who were covenanted together um, as believers. Yes. So you'll see in all the colonial records, they'll talk about first church, second church, first churches, which they're talking about the group of people when they say that, though it's very hard for us to not think church building because that's right. what we have been brought up with. And yeah, the Congregationalists. Uh, were still identifiable, clearly identifiable, and really still in the majority for white um, people in New England for a long time into the 1800s, surprisingly long time. 
because you'll hear people talk about how oh puritanism really started dying away like in the 1600s and here it is you know 150 years later it was still kind of going strong um, in some aspects remarkably similar to how it had been in 1630 hmm. and in others utterly changed my sense of that split is i don't know if it's true overall but that there was some correlation between who got the church and who got the silver who got the building itself and and who got the valuable objects inside and that the congregationalists tended to walk away with the objects and the Unitarians kept the building. Um, if that's true, yeah. how does that correlate with what you're telling us about what church meant to the Puritans? That's a great point to bring up. The, the bitter uh, mantra of the Congregationalists was that the Unitarian, the Congregationalists, wait, that the Unitarians kept the building and the Congregationals kept the faith. Ah. So even then, there was this idea that um, true congregationalism was about, you know, the spiritual and not about um, the church or outward shows of wealth or having a fancy building or things like that. Or, you know, even the minister wearing some kind of fancy robes, you know, they were still not doing that as late as the 1830s, um, though those were outward ways in which original congregationalism was maintained. But again, the real ideal that they all lived by was long gone of going to three church services a week, of meeting constantly together to pray and to discuss sermons and to do spiritual seeking and to always be available to each other, meeting all the time to get unanimous agreement on important, like all of that was long gone. So keeping the faith, <laughs> I'm not sure. They can't claim that they were really keeping the, the original faith, but at least they weren't connected to the building. It's funny now that what's the building that every town, you know, will make the most of and treasure and spend millions of dollars to maintain. It's the old congregational church is completely at odds with what the people who originally you know, met in those buildings would have wanted. They would have said, so, you know, that building's a hundred years old. It's falling apart. Tear it down. Meet in, meet in a basement somewhere. <laughs> Why does it matter? This, this study has really changed my feelings about all these colonial houses that, you know, I was a tour guide at the colonial house in Arlington for years and I cherished it. And now I just think, oh, these houses, and they're just, they're just symbols of everything that went wrong. <laughs> like it's all drained away from me. So maybe I should start leaning towards that house again in this <laughs> and give a different message. I don't know if that would be welcome. Hmm. I, someone's Unitarian congregation locked the congregational minister out of the meeting house. There are amazing tales told in the church records, including one at Rowley, about um, just such a thing. One church um, had a minister and they were thinking of getting someone to be the second, like the assistant. And this a guy came to be the assistant and wouldn't leave. And one Sunday morning, the minister showed up to give the sermon and the assistant was like in the pulpit waiting for him. Like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> they had a, a tense, a tense standoff there. But like a good minister was supposed to be, the minister said, you know, I'm not going to force you to leave. You know, and he went and he sat down and then when the church came in, they all had a lengthy meeting about what to do, which is how you were supposed to resolve things. Yeah, all these, you know, all these churches now too also have all the fancy communion silver and all these fancy things that they weren't weren't supposed to be connected to, though even in the early records, you see them constantly taking up um, collections, special collections to get something to hold communion with. Like we at least need a platter for the bread and we need some kind of cups for people to drink out of. And so there was, and a tablecloth was very important to them. They wanted to have a tablecloth. That was the one extravagance they allowed themselves that this should happen on a tablecloth. So they were often uh, raising money for that. 
I think that's about it. These have been fantastic questions. And this is the first time I have talked about this new work I'm doing. So it's a little bit of a jumble, but uh, there's a million new ideas going on in my head about this topic I have studied for years. And that's the beauty of studying something for years is that it's evergreen. And as long as you keep expanding your horizon of what you're looking at, who you're listening to, there's always going to be some new take that you can have on it that makes the study interesting. And that in this case really makes me think about how all this relates to the present day. And I think potential solutions for the problems we face with climate change and the rise of toxic individuality in this country, uh, solutions could lie in looking outside all of the ideas we have inherited to voices that aren't heard as often, including indigenous voices. So I think it's 820. I don't know how we sign off <laughs> or if people want to stay a little longer, I'll stay till 8.30 if anyone would like to stay and just continue chatting. Would, would any of the women that you wrote about in your previous book be examples of people that lived for the common good? That's tricky. Again, I would have immediately said, yes, yes, all of them <laughs> before. It's harder with women because they don't appear in the records anywhere else. I was talking with Eve, who actually said a great, a great line. She said, the women that are in those records, we know their deepest, most emotional thoughts and feelings and life experiences, and we don't know their names. Some of them, we don't know their first names. And it's astounding. So what I say about those records is they are strictly spiritual. These women don't talk about being mothers, being wives, daughters, being pregnant, having none of it. They are focused on just their spiritual journey. And so in those spiritual lives, they practiced very loving mutual watch and really felt that their purpose on this earth was to support each other in that seeking and to love each other and help each other. But in their non-spiritual lives, they ran those households and they ran those farms and gardens and did the buying and selling and raising and enslaving and, and did all of those things. So again, it's that split personality within the religious ideal. Yeah, they really practiced community and outside of it, they did not. They were part of the, you know, even the having nine kids, everybody having nine children was kind of an individualism run rampant. Like I need to have enough children to make sure that my land can be worked profitable and passed down so that my house is established and they were part of that. And sadly, we don't always get to know their feelings about it, but we can be kind of sure that like most people raised deeply within a, a society, they didn't question it. There's a, a note from Roxanne that um, the next talk next week by Bob Allison, uh, is the common good, who's good, who's common. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm giving the time correctly. Maybe somebody else knows the uh, exact day. Oh, here it is. Uh, no, actually, it's not. It's so a week from tonight? A week from tonight. Okay, so Tuesday yeah, at 7 o'clock. That's seven again. I think so, yes. Looking forward to that talk. Oh, uh, we'll excuse me, it it's Wednesday, Wednesday next week. So it's October 6th, 7 to 8.30. So we do same time, different day. Oh, okay. October 6th, Wednesday, Bob Allison's talk. I will be there. I know that it's going to be good. And you know, again, we don't wanna fall into the anachronism of, well, why didn't they welcome in everybody? You know, it's very hard to find any people in any time or place, anywhere who welcomed everybody. You know, every community has its sense of, of limits. And to have a common good, you have to feel that you have something in common. And so it's trying to expand that sense of how, how do you hold something in common and what does that mean? 
you know, that's important. So thank you very much, Lori, uh, for your wonderful talk. And um, we hope to see you all next week, next Wednesday, at a talk called The Common Good, Who's Good? Who's Common about the Boston Common given by Bob Allison. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And um, I hope to see you I'm soon. Just, I'm just putting in the title of the book. <laughs> Someone asked what the title of my book was. I just put it in the chat. <laughs> and then we, can, then we can sign off. The book is uh, Records can... of Trial in Thomas Shepherd's Church in Cambridge, 1638 to 1647, nine. nine. And nine. it's also called Heroic Souls, published by um, Paul Grave Macmillan. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Good night.